but I mean, if we're, we'll see how he does with this increase of speed because he does, it does seem to be a little better. And then I'm just thinking about the swell going up the stern of the ship too, which is not is not actually as bad as you think. I'm just looking at the heave right now. I, I just refreshed it. <clears throat> it might be some, sometimes it doesn't get hooked up on the, it's like a Tim, a Tim thing. Yeah. Did you see him put his speed input in? Was it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, just sometimes you just got to give it a bit of time. With too many inputs, and in you end up fighting yourself a little bit. So this will be good because we can make up some, we can get some vertical ground if this keeps working. Questions coming in or pretty quiet? A little quiet, but send them in if you have them. Mm -hmm. A lot of late night watchers who are grateful that we're on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if speed's it's... coming down now. That's much better. Okay, let us not stop the ship for anything. <laughs> <laughs> there will... <laughs> no. Do once, it. Once Argus gets going, it'll, yeah. we'll be moving. Yeah. Oh, kind of sit there, but... We have a question coming in now. Um, some people are curious about this seamount that we're looking at um, and whether it's named or not, which it is not named. Many of the seamounts that we're going to be exploring in this expedition have not been named yet. Um, and we're really exploring to learn a lot more about these. So this seamount that we're looking at tonight, um, we started off tonight at about 3,900 meters depth. And the summit of that seamount 
um, is at about 1,800 meters depth. So we're moving across the seamount um, and trying to understand a bit more about the origins of that. Again, some questions about how seamounts are formed. Right. Yeah, seamounts are, are really quite dominant uh, in the ocean. They're formed by a variety of processes, but typically they are usually involve some sort of submarine volcanism uh, that over time, you know, might be derived from a hot spot uh, or some other source of volcanism uh, in the deep sea, like a spreading center, or sometimes you can even get seamounts that are just uh, you know, uplift of seafloor. Um, in the Caribbean, for example, you get seamounts that uh, might have started as a, a small bump or small uh, rise in the ocean that have just been uplifted over time so they're largely sedimentary or carbonate. It's still moving. But generally, the all the sea, these sea mounts started out as volcanoes that, uh, in this case, they probably never reached the surface or anywhere close to the surface. If they had, they typically acquire a carbonate cap, uh, which is a type of rock that animals typically produce, uh, like corals, in which case we would call it a guillot. It would probably have a flat top to it. But it seems like from the mapping we've done, none of these are really uh, geodes, so they're likely just seamounts that never quite reached the surface. Volcanoes. So they're like pointier topped volcanoes, mm -hmm. the way we, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, either smooth or pointy top, yep. Uh, typically, uh, yeah, even if a volcano or seamount rises to a certain point, you know, when the hot spot moves on or with the, when the plate is moves away from where the heat source is, these mountains will typically subside back down deeper, so it could change on the order of hundreds of meters um, over the course of its lifespan. But one of the things we can do with the rocks that we collect is, you know, tell how old some of these volcanoes are uh, which is important for understanding how, well, both, you know, which hotspot might have formed these volcanoes, but also which uh, directions and how the plate, Pacific plate, has moved through geologic history. Check out how crinkly these are. This is a really yeah. neat little rock spot. These are, yeah, these are almost certainly um, exploded pillows. Oh, wow. Yeah, so when... Um, Pillow basalts are typically formed when you have very hot uh, magma comes out of the crust and just forms a, a very lumpy boulder, essentially. Uh, but oftentimes when it hits the cold seawater, you know, something very hot touching something very cold will often result in an uh, expansion of... Um, Typically, it results in gases being let off. Uh, Here's another one of those little well, tunicate guys. Blowing out. Limpet tunicates. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Tunicate or limpet, still unidentified. Yeah, these are super dramatic. They're really cool. Yeah. So, in uh, if you see these fresh, they typically are quite jagged. Um, they looked exactly like if you broke a piece of glass or something. Um, but, you know, after they've been on the seafloor for hundreds or not hundreds, but maybe tens of millions of years, they're going to look much more smooth as the crust precip precipitates out onto the seafloor. I may have missed this from before, but do we have an age on this formation here? Uh, we do not. Like in like hundreds of millions, like any? Yeah, that it. it I hope that, uh, you know, I don't know uh, of any rock dredging that's occurred on this particular seamount. Um, okay. But, you know, there's a lot of different geologic complexity in this area. You know, we have the Hawaiian Range uh, and Hawaiian seamounts, which are you know, very, very young, you know, on the order of a few million years um, old. And then we have other seamounts like the ones we visited on our previous cruise in the uh, the Wentworth chain, um, which is 
probably in the order of 70 million years, maybe 80 million okay. years. Um, so part of the objective of sampling rocks on these seamounts are to better refine those ages. You know, we potentially have multiple hotspots that have passed through here and then have ejected uh, magma onto the sea floor and built these seamounts, but remember the Pacific plate is moving all the time and the hotspots are relatively stationary. So the, the result is that you might have several different hotspots over printing other seamount chains. <laughs> yeah, I I do agree that these rocks do look nice, but they're probably some of the deceptive ones. They look like they're loose, but as soon as you go to touch them, they're right. Solid. I believe you on that one. Um, we're still a little wobbly with getting the ship going, but mm -hmm. I think um kind of learning some lessons about how to move it. So hopefully this next this next try will work. Yeah. There's a three one zero. Yeah, I'm all for not stopping the ship. Yeah. Just keep it going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was even we didn't even stop the ship that time. That was just a slight heading change and it had to do like a little loop. Steve, can you see um I think can we you just added a hundred meters, didn't you? And then it, then it didn't. We didn't even change the bearing. We just added 100 meters. Oh, yeah. oh the th we were already on 310? Uh. Okay, this was this was still 3 Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Still not. Okay. Steve, can you see Nav G back there? Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. So you have some idea of Paul's Paul's struggles. <laughs> Is that who's on the bridge tonight? I think so. Yeah. yeah. That's who we've got, right? Oh, what do we got there? Ooh. Okay. Fine. Here's fine. an old friend. Yep. A very nice bamboo coral. Just gonna do some gauge checking. Go for it. With uh, a few brittle, brittle star associates on there. Unbranched, of course. Typically, what we see at these depths. But that's good. That's a good sign. That means we're moving up into depths where we can get more substantial coral and sponge fauna. Yay! We're kind of in the depth range that we did our deepest dives on the last cruise. So I suspect from now on we'll start to see things that are more similar to what we saw at the uh, site we were last week. Okay. What sort of differences would you expect between the two seamounts or the two like sort of seamount chains, I guess? Yeah, I think um, probably not much uh, in the terms of diversity of species. Um, the greatest differences we'll probably see are, uh, you know, if this is a much younger or older feature, we're probably going to see differences in substrate type, which might dictate which species we could find attached. Okay. Um, depending on how old or stable the crusts are older stable the rocks are but yeah, for the most part um, we consider the area around Hawaii to be one by a geographic unit meaning you know the species we find here are more similar to each other on seamounts here than say from here to Kingman and Palmyra or you know, Jarvis or okay. Helen and Baker Island which are a bit further south And is that just because there's so much distance that it's harder for those to kind of reproduce onto like a 
a neighboring seamount or? Yeah, it, there's, um, there's a bunch of hypotheses about, you know, if seamounts are stepping stones for species to get across large expanses of the ocean. Um, I'm in the camp that it's probably more due to oceanographic differences hmm. uh, and how currents move around seamounts as well as uh, you know, how currents have historically moved around seamounts um, over evolutionary time. So, for example, how water masses are structured in the ocean up in the North Pacific are going to be very different from how they're structured along the equator, um, and then also some east-west variation uh, in the deep water currents as well. Local oceanography makes a big difference. So a little on that note, some questions from viewers. Um, what are these organisms that we're seeing eating down here? The ones that are grazing on the rock, I'm assuming? Really any. Yeah. <laughs> All these different kind of organisms at depth. So maybe yeah, more general. chat about yeah, what we're seeing and maybe why they're on seamounts to begin with. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Wow, that is a big boulder. Wow, yeah, that's so super cool. <laughs> that's so another, cool. Another exploded pillow or something? <laughs> yeah, clearly. Yeah. You can huh. definitely tell, you know, where the center of it is and then just it's blown apart. Totally, yeah. Um, so what are things eating down here? So there's no sunlight down here, so these animals are clearly not photosynthesizing uh, with sunlight, um, either either them or any compo component of the plankton. But for the most part, what they're eating are uh, bits of what we call marine snow, which is basically clumps of organic material that drifts down from the surface. They may have been so you know, bits of okay. phytoplankton or, you know, Bits of bacteria and other zooplankton parts that have just died and massed together, one. sunk to the seafloor. And uh, that provides a lot of the organic carbon that a lot of these animals need to survive. Oh. There's a worm on the bottom right. Bridge, Nav. Can we continue this move bearing three one zero one hundred meters? Yeah. <laughs> Good eyes. I'll catch the next one. I just felt it and I looked over. Yeah, totally. I just saw that. <laughs> yeah. S following up on the, the food food question, um, there's a couple of ways that animals can take advantage of that. We've seen so far. Some of them being the suspension feeders, so animals that pick out particles from the water column. Uh, these could include corals, filter feeders, uh, pumping water through their bodies, like the sponges, um, or the deposit feeders, which are like the sea cucumbers and um, you know, snails and clams and things. Uh, well, not clams, but you know, mollusks that might be grasping at you know, these sediment drapes we see on the sea floor. Do we see many mollusks, mollusks <laughs> at this depth? Well, what's this on the left here? Yeah, we can. Yep. Oh, that's a oh, yeah. crinoid. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I have to get crack in here yep. a little bit. Definitely getting some more verticality here. Yeah. See if you can transition to the next move there uh, without, because uh, you just put in another, correct? Yeah, he seems to be doing pretty good. Awesome. Now he's slowing down. We could use a DVL reset, but. Um, yeah, I've got no auto, so I'm happy if you want to. I would like that too. I think that's a good idea. 
Done and done. Yes. Yeah, he's moving. Cool. We will never stop again. <laughs> <laughs> right I don't up. know where we'll be in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Could be anywhere. <laughs> Make that jump from seamount to seamount. <laughs> yeah, come up. Sorry, Allison. <laughs> Boxes overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> Trading old samples for new samples. <laughs> well, oh. Can't stop, can't stop. <laughs> yeah, you haven't lived until you tried to stick a rock in a suction tube. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, have you tried to have somebody stick a rock in a suction tube? Not yet, but you know we <laughs> might try. Got to break a thousand pounds. Yeah, we got our work cut out for Otherwise us. Otherwise, we're not making money on the pallet shipment. We have to do. <laughs> okay, so we have six Niskins per dive, <laughs> <laughs> and we have to take a Niskin with each rock. <laughs> uh, what's what's the weight? The minimum weight of each rock we need to get to beat the record of <laughs> nine hundred pounds. Yeah, I think it's going to be pretty. Like one hundred and fifty at least. Yeah, one hundred and fifty would would do it. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, we we might have ability to uh, send a second pallet, so we might have no constraints. In which case, who knows? It's on the sky's the limit, really. Hey, really? <laughs> you know, how big of a rock can you pick up? Um, a pretty big one. <laughs> like you saw, you saw the um, like fifty-five pounds or something. Oh, um, you saw that the the columnar basalt that oh, yeah. Trevor picked up and put on the porch last time. He said. Just judging by ballast alone, that would have that would have been at least seventy. Wow! Yeah. Whoa! There's a big Dr. Seuss sponge in Argus. We also fell off our track just okay. a bit. Okay. To the south. Oh, there he goes. See, so he did he? Okay. Um. Uh-huh. Yeah, because he, yeah, because he's like at 150 now again. Okay. Um, It does seem to get us back on track. I don't know whether what's getting us back on track is him putting the move in again or um, just moving on with life. Can you come up, Josh? Yep. Looks like what we might be seeing here is a combination of pillows and maybe cracked sheet flows. Uh, sheet flows being when you have lava just you know coming out in sheets down a, a feature, but there's also some still blown apart chunks of. Oh yeah, here's pillow. one. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch here. Yeah. Okay. So are we waiting until we reach 3,000 meter depth until we take another rock? Is that right? Yeah, about, you know, okay. plus or minus. It's okay. Quick zoom video. Nice little charismatic sponge. Yep. Okay, go on. Charismatic sponge. Mm -hmm. Those stock sponges are really cool look to look at. Yeah. I've heard them described, I forget who described them to me, as like being more like a kite than like a support structure. It's like um, the the stock actually like sort of flies the sponge in the in the current. Yep. As opposed to like holding it up, like pushing it up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The We saw ones on the last cruise that were in excess of a few meters. Um, yeah, you know, if you can get up of off the bottom, you know, when water moves across the seamount, it's 
being slowed down by friction, right? There's friction between the, the fluid layer and then the rock. And typically, if you're living on very minuscule amounts of food, you know, that might not be the greatest strategy is just living on the bottom, close to the bottom. If you can pull yourself off the bottom and feed in the flow, where you have a faster rate of food delivery, you're going to be more successful. Okay. So that's what the idea is. Yeah, yeah. For these suspension and filter feeders. Oh, that's a nice one. Nice. Kind of reminds me of the sponges we were seeing last time. Yeah, totally. Uh, uh, poly polyopagon or ferronomatid sponges. This one has some interesting growths coming out of it. Uh, that might be interesting to look at. Still looks alive. It's a cool base. You can really see those individual yeah. fibers. Right. Give me a zoom video. Oven mitt. You can go. Push in a little more, maybe. Tight. Yeah. So we've got a glass sponge here. You can see the, the feather, the, the fiberiness of it. Uh, oh. Those are all glass spicules. Okay, I'm going to get crack in here. Come along. Yep. You can probably get a decent ID on that. It's probably polyopagon. Kind of the more common uh, sponge genus we've had in this area. Those like fibers that are attaching to the rock, is it the base is expanding and it's growing out, or what is it? What is happening there? Yeah, uh, kind of. Yeah, they they the fibers, you know, they lay down these fibers to the base, and then typically they'll grow both, you know, from the base, but more slowly, and then also grow out from quick the zoom, just real tips quick. of the colony. Nice. Okay, moving on. Uh, so the ridge that we're following, it does a little sinusoidally, so it's not directly in one straight line. But if we keep going on this bearing, we'll still be heading up ridge and he head towards our next waypoint. So I'm keen just to keep the same bearing and not be like switching around bearings to follow the top of the ridge the entire time. Um, but that does mean we might be falling off a little bit, especially on the will fall off on the west side but it doesn't look super steep um i love that idea okay we'll just monitor it but yeah. we know that we won't be able to make any quick bearing change yeah that seems that okay. seems good to me what do you think josh yeah sounds good as long as uh science d is good with that yep cool what are the contours on the high pack right now 10 meters yeah, um, so we're calling in 310 moves, but we're moving at 330, um, and that will just bring us up towards there. Looks great. Okay. It actually looks like until they, until we got on watch, they were doing okay with those, with getting the ship going again. Yeah. Um, it's very true. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the exact same thing. <laughs> They've, they've, they've got Lucky Jake on the last watch. <laughs> What's that? It was Luck, Lucky Jake. Lucky Jake on the Lucky last Jake. watch. Yeah. <laughs> I was on the that watch on the last cruise, and Jake's just got some luck. <laughs> Can I take a look at this coral coming up? Yeah. Bamboo, maybe? We'll see. Got a couple of things going on here. Give me a zoom. I think we have a winner. Yeah, it looks like a bamboo. Cool. Yeah, you can see, uh, and if you look, if you look through the tissue, you should be able to see dark black bands, these nodes. Uh, you can actually see one on the branch tip that's broken. That's part of a node, uh, just broken off uh, above the node there. But otherwise, uh, awesome. this is a very interesting colony because the polyps are kind of biserially arranged along. They're coming out both sides. Okay, go wide. Go wide. It's also got crinoid associate. 
Oh, I love these red crinoids. They're yeah. so bright. Yeah, I'm I'm more confident now that these are probably Proisocrinus. They're just not very vibrant red, but we're also okay. kind of on the extreme of their depth range on the deep end. So we should probably see more of a typical red pattern coming up. That one's not. I different. feel like we're getting into like the land of more, more living creatures. Ooh. Yeah. Yep. Pretty cool. Look at those. They're yeah, beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice colophagus sponges. Oftentimes you'll see small associated animals Pretty living inside, right like on squat lobsters, uh, or shrimp. Inside. Okay, I see it. Thank you. Right where the BBL is. Gabby, when you get a sec, do you want to try the slightest tilt down? I'm just noticing these little tiny flares. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thank you. It's a pretty fresh. I, I should try and re-reference the porch. I've sort of been sure. looking up a little bit at a time with each sort of set down. There we go. Okay. Thank I'm you. happy. Whoa, this is a cool little rock formation here. Yeah, these look like columnar basalts. Oh yeah. Oh, I love these things. Yeah. They're so neat. Maybe some brittle stars or brisingid sea stars. That red, uh, yeah, brisingid on the rock there. Uh, yeah, columnar basalts or you know, some pillows mixed in as well. Very good age dating rock. Be pretty sure you'll probably get some crystals in there for getting a good dating of the sample. I will say that you know the past two cruises have been enlightening. This one and the previous one because we've had so much geology input and we've been sharing ideas, biologists and geologists learned a lot of geology words that aren't in my repertoire. Yeah, you sound like a geologist. Yeah. <laughs> Just play one on the internet, though. <laughs> Back at home, I'm Steve, the coral guy. Dead uh, coral? Uh, possibly. Tough to tell. Could be retracted polyps. There's mostly live oh, on there, yeah. just contracted polyps and tentacles. Looks similar species to what we saw previously, but Go for zoom. it's got these really nice Ray sparse snatch. branches. Oh, yeah, that's a bamboo. All right. We continue that move, bearing 310. Okay, go wide. Great, great. For 100 yeah, meters. Fantastic. You can actually see some of the sclerites coming out of the colony, uh, which is indicative of certain kinds of clades. That was interesting to see almost all of them retracted. Yeah, yeah, it was. Usually they do that all together if they've taken a meal recently or if uh, they've been potentially predated upon. They've taken a meal, meaning they've eaten a lot in a short amount of time? or Yeah, you know, um, anemones, for example, when they eat something, they catch something, they'll kind of put the food item in their mouth and then kind of close up a little bit hey, to buddy. digest it. Corals do something similar. Huh. It's, it's hard for me to imagine because I think, because usually they're just eating like out of the water column, but is there something, an event that would give them that? Yeah, it's, it, you know, small food particles, they kind of, you know, there, there's some communication amongst the polyps, so they may not all, all have had fed at the same time. Um, but, you know, if there's you know, some you know, big food pulse or something, maybe grab some good food, they might all close up to uh, help digest the product, or you know, maybe they're doing that to shed 
mucus, for example, and clean themselves off. They do that once in a while as well. Mm. Oh. Data, with these stops, am I giving you enough time to get a capture or two? And the garbage. Yeah, that's good. Okay, awesome. Some trash. Feel free trash to trash. like no. if you if you did not get the capture you need to just say, you know, hold on for a second. And if I can, I will. Okay. Thank you. The second or third piece of debris they've seen on the seamount so far. We're pretty remote, but uh, you know, occasionally we'll see things like soda cans and bottles and barrels. Go for zoom. Very nice anemone. Okay. Very similar to Go what wide. we sampled on the last cruise. Uh, that was a bit of a curiosity. We were we were remarking on the last cruise that anemones don't get enough respect because they kind of get overlooked. They, you know, they can be abundant. But they're like basically big corals, right? Yeah, yeah. They're in the same group as corals and, um, you know, the siphonophores we saw earlier. Uh, the cnidarians, they sting their prey items. Um, but, yeah, you can think of, uh, you know, a coral colony being a ton of tiny little small coordinated anemones um, or a coral a, 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 you know a anemone as a single type of coral but uh, it's Jess and I decided that corals were anemones with an HOA basically <laughs> <laughs> oh tunicate yeah there you go very nice tunicate yeah wow it's suspended by a very thin fiber yeah, it looked like it was floating there for a second, but now I see. Yeah. Okay. Skedaddle. <laughs> a lot of the differences between anemones and corals, though, are often more internal than external. Oh, so, okay. Uh, Anemones are typically identified by internal features, um, like the arrangement of different tissues and mesenteries, how they're arranged around the mouth, for example. Um, you know, you, you can use uh, genetics to tell them apart as well, but uh, more often than not, um, you know, taking a look at their internal anatomy will tell you a lot uh, about different species of Anemones, whereas in corals, it's a little bit different. You have some more features like branching characteristics to look at, uh, sclerite morphologies, stuff like that. Cool. Nice lumpy textured rock here. Could be more crusty. When's our next rock sample scheduled for? Uh, around 3,000 meters. Okay. So, you know, starting maybe 3,100 or, you know, 3,120, we'll start taking a look around. Uh, okay. so it gives us 100 meters of vertical to play with. What's that little plateau, the depth of that plateau look like? Uh, yeah, what's that? Ooh, hold on. I know we, a way we can do this. We're going to take off those 10-meter contours. We'll put on the 50-meter ones. All right. So this is going to be 3,300, 250, 200. Um, well, sorry, 150. So Zoom video? Look at this little guy. Somewhere around there. Oh, yeah. Look at him. Oh, very nice. Aww. So cute. Yeah. He's very cute. Yeah, my nice. guess is that is okay, 3,125 in here. Lovely. Thanks, where Steve. the plateau is. Nice slime star. Is that what that is? Yep. Oh, cool. Yeah, slime star. That looks way different. Sea star. Yeah, yep. then the last slime star was really goopy looking. Yeah, they have a 
you can imagine how they got their name. Um, definitely not something you can see on the seafloor, but if you were to collect one, they are prolific slime producers. Oh, really? They mm -hmm. like produce it when you like uh -oh. basically disturb them? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. As soon as you put it in that box, they will fill up the box with lots of goopy slime. Oh, like hagfish? Yep. yep. Similar stuff? Like very unrelated similar. creatures, but... It's a very effective defense mechanism for animals because, you know, it's, it's unpalatable for predators, potentially. And you think it tastes bad? Like, is it, it like, poisonous? Good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> Mucus doesn't generally evoke mm, oh, okay. positive feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I just like wonder how, like, if predators really feel that way. They're like, ew, this tastes like snot. Putting this back. Yeah, I mean, well, mucus can get caught on your gills, you know, it can okay. suffocate you potentially. Oh, yeah, that sounds real bad. Yeah. You know, if, ooh, if you're a small ooh, parasite, beautiful. for example. Oh, yeah. It could literally prevent you from breathing uh, if it, you know, Ooh. encapsulates you. Um, yeah, nice persinged sea star right there. Yeah. Again, a, another relative of that slime star we just saw. We've been successful at I this know. bearing for like 250 I meters, know, and I'm Katie. so scared to do anything else. I'm like, oh, am I gonna jinx it? I was just about to look over and be like, our evil plan is working. <laughs> oh. What do we tell the next watch? Just, just here, hold this, hold this. <laughs> Don't, Don't touch move. anything. Don't touch a thing. <laughs> When the bottom disappears, it's time mm -hmm. to come up. I feel like every time a watch changes over, whatever like delicate equilibrium you've established during your watch like instantaneously falls apart. Yeah. And so it always looks like you've handed the next watch a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I will Sometimes say. on purpose, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever solve the mystery of the Argus altimeter, Gabby? Um, yes, I did. Um, they don't like the noise that it produces in the sub bottom, and so they turn it off. In fact, Trevor's watch did too, and so basically, we were the only watch flying with that altimeter. Clearly. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. It's on, on right now. Yeah, it's on right now. So every single time we would get on watch, we like Dan and I would look at it and be like, "What? They turned off the altimeter? What are they doing? What are they thinking?" <laughs> get all like ranty like we do and uh yeah they're like we don't like the noise and we don't use it so we turned it off like oh that's actually really good reason definitely been a bit of a change in the biology since we got on watch it's been pretty sparse down there maybe we saw a few sponges but now we're starting to see some more Megafauna, definitely more corals. There were some suspicious primnoids and things we haven't seen yet down deeper, so maybe we might have lost those deeper species, but definitely picking up a, a bit more diversity of invertebrates. What has changed um, at this depth that would make it more suitable for all these different creatures. Ooh, tunicate. Uh, you know, habitat complexity is important. Um, so diversity of, of substrate types. So some things like you can might zoom prefer a bit, to settle on boulders. 
uh, where you have better flows. Oh, very nice. Ooh, wow. Tunicate. See all the eternal, internal anatomy there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but, you know, on the order of hundreds or thousands of meters, as you start to move up, um, the food supply becomes a little bit more um, nutritious for animals. Hmm. So you can imagine when these marine snow particles sink down to the seafloor, they're constantly being consumed by bacteria, right? And bacteria are taking the carbon, respiring, producing CO2, and you know, drawing down the nutrient quality, the carbon quantity, organic carbon quantity, so that the things that live on the very, very bottom of the ocean have very, very poor quality food. And so uh, as you move up thousands of meters, it becomes easier to feed. Things can grow bigger, more nutritious, and uh, more vibrant communities. Very cool. But sometimes, you know, that's not the only thing we'll see on these seamounts. Um, depending on which axis of the seamount we're diving on, which ridge, um, certain ridges might have, uh, you know, very good larval supplies, for example, uh, where you have lots of potential larvae recruiting on a ridge or a seamount um, uh, flank, uh, whereas another side might be in a shadow. And so you get kind of a disproportionate uh, differences in, in settlement, which results in kind of these areas that are relatively barren and more areas that are more lush. When you say flank versus shadow of a seamount, what are you referring to just like a side of a seamount so you know a ridge for example that juts out from the side of a seamount um, might have um, accelerated flows across it because when water impinges on a substrate it has to go around or has to go up or down and typically it goes faster around that mm. uh, feature but if you're in kind of one of the faces of the seamount where it's not very ridgy you're going to have more of just a, a slope that is um, maybe perhaps more sluggish currents. So ridges like the one we're diving today typically will have the best representation of the fauna that can live on a seamount at these depths. How are you feeling about this? We can give us a more northerly Ooh. one and it will... So we're still going up slope, but you can see that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, I can start to feel that. Um, we can sure try if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I, yeah, yeah. I've, it's been really steady. Yeah. Bridge, Nav. Can we move one zero zero meters at bearing three three zero? Yep, so a hundred meter move at bearing three three zero. There we go. Disrupted the equilibrium. We did. I feel like just we're playing dice right now. Just I know. <laughs> There's going to be cascading effects. <laughs> but, you know, you got to live dangerously sometimes. I like your style, Kate. Yeah. It could be great. I just want to know we can make moves as normal. Yeah. He hasn't been using as much as the thrusters, which makes me think that Maybe it's getting a little better. Maybe, yeah. All right, I'm going to time this. Yeah, it's a Let's nice see how long it takes. crinoid stock there. You can see the how the other brittle stars that are on the crinoid stock are using that elevation to feed up into the flow. Go for zoom. 
They have all their arms extended. These uh, they're called the um, Ophiocanthids, the brittle stars. They have large spines on their arms, and presumably they could use those to catch little bits of marine snow and particulate matter. Uh, kind of like fishing. Oh yeah, they're Look so cool. Them. Yeah. Nice. Got two types of echinoderms there. You've got the crinoid as well as the brittle stars. Beauty. I wonder why these aren't jumping off though. These would be the ones that typically jump off when they sense the vehicles approaching. Great zoom. Okay, go wide. Actually, oh, there's a white squat lobster. Oh, I used up all of my zooming time. <laughs> we'll get I'm the next so one. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Your 10 seconds of zooming time. <laughs> Do a countdown It's like my time. screen time. Can I, I can crush more? three candies. Put some more quarters in the machine. <laughs> some more zoom time. Ashley, if you ever want to see, uh, if you ever want to capture an image with the lasers off, uh -huh. uh, just, f just let us know. Up in the front row. Yep. And same, if we forget to turn them back on, just and you want to size something, ask for them to be put on. Yeah, Ashley, feel free to ask for anything like that. If you want to get like a beauty capture as well as like um, a quantitative capture. Yeah, thanks. So far, they've been really great zooms, so I appreciate it. Awesome. Got that really clear water again where you can, can't really even see the laser beams. You can just see the dots landing. Yep. Steve, I put another quarter in the zoom machine, so <laughs> get this one. <laughs> Go for zoom. Nice, another bamboo coral. See some okay. of the nodes uh, through the tissue there. Sorry, was that? Did you want to come white? Uh, yeah, you can come white now. I said okay, and then realized I had like you know a dime left, like ten cents left on my zoom. Yeah. It's like okay, usually like those giant white. binoculars. Yeah, it does. And then <laughs> have it. sorry, okay. <laughs> I'll be more clear. Yeah, like at the pier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, here's a little eel. Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Some fish now. That one's almost certainly a cutthroat eel. In the Synaphobranchid family. Very common at these depths. So they're actually pretty deep, but they'll become more common as we get shallower. Uh, he did pretty good, but then he fell off, so... So it hasn't actually really changed. It's changed the bearing just a yeah. little bit. And it took about two minutes for him to change. Okay. Um, and I'm keeping my eye on to see when Argus updates. Okay. But the general trend is more northerly. Okay. So. Sounds good. Oh, yeah, totally. That's fine. Brittle star bailed out from somewhere. Yeah, was like, that a brittle where star? Where did that? Is it <laughs> yeah. raining brittle stars now? Where did that come from? <laughs> I wonder if it had jumped onto the vehicle or something. Like, 
Oh, maybe. Maybe like on a Zoom, like one of the brittle stars that likes to bail out, like bail down <laughs> out of the vehicle. It's just <laughs> weird that it came from a phone. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I thought it was a crinoid. Oh, was it? Okay. Oh, maybe that makes more sense. Yeah, a little swimmier. I thought the same thing, Gabby. I was like, where are they coming from? The, the elusive pelagic brittle star. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, that makes a ton more sense, Steve. <laughs> yes. Well, hey, if the sea cucumbers can live their whole lives in the blue water, why can't brittle yeah. stars? So it sounds like a Disney movie in the making. <laughs> <laughs> I would watch that. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> it's a really uplifting story. Can, can they get? Can they swim? The brittle stars. Brittle stars. Yeah. Um, actually, they can. Yeah. They can get up in the. Cloud. Um, cool. Some of them, yeah, in sh in the shallower waters. Uh, some of them will actually move their arms and swim in a stroke, uh, and it's really kind of mind-bending to see. Is uh, it sort of like crinoid locomotion? It, it's not up and down. It's more like okay. uh, like a consistent like stroke pattern. Um, Looking back at you, you were doing you were going for like a yeah, breaststroke there. More like yeah, more like a, a stroke. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting a demonstration. Don't you dare put that camera on me. <laughs> Thank you. I feel like the people need to see. <laughs> you sure you don't want to show them? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but you see them walking across the seafloor sometimes, swimming if needed. But that's very very rare and usually more shallow. Oh, this is a cute one. Quick zoom. Got there. Yeah, another slime star. Oh, okay. Yep. Cool. I've seen quite a bit of diversity of slime stars on this okay, expedition more than any other. Normally, it's just the, the purple ones, but there's lots of different colors. They could also be, you know, there's some differences in smaller ones versus uh, larger ones. They have slightly different or darker pigmentations as they get older. But uh, all the slime stars belong to the same family, the Terasteridae, with a silent P, PT. That's a, another eel. Oh, yeah, way off in the distance. Steve, did you see the infamous turkey-looking slime star from the last? Turkey slime star? No, I didn't. Oh, we'll I'll have to show you that one. Yeah. It looked like a turkey that was about to go in the oven. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> this was the last one? Last this was cruise? on the last cruise, yeah, yeah. on the 12 to 4 yeah. watch at some point. You sure it wasn't an actual turkey? Because we had Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> it was Thanksgiving. <laughs> 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 you, you tell me. You're the, you're the biologist. <laughs> I'll show you pictures. All right, I'll take a look at it later. <laughs> it was pretty odd looking. Why didn't that make the highlight reels? <laughs> if that was a perfect subject. I mean, it material. wasn't. It was like a plucked turkey. It wasn't okay. like an attractive turkey. Right. Well, I wouldn't expect it to be a feathered turkey on no. the seafloor. That's silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, down at the, the bottom of the sea, that'd be ridiculous. <laughs> 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 How could you even suggest such a thing? <laughs> Are you on auto XY, Gabby? I am not. Resetting. Thank you. Um, Are you okay with this? Should we keep moving a little bit more northerly? I mean, this is fine if it's fine for Steve. It's pretty easy to navigate. Okay. Um, You know, I can keep Herc uphill of Argus by a few meters and... 
So that seems fine. If Steve's yeah. okay, I'm okay. Yeah, All right. I, I like this. We're moving at a good pace. All right. Um, when we get up to the top,